when estrogen is high, we have tep we have these very active dendrites. We have a very receptive extension of the neuron that's trying to grab information and carry information. But when estrogen goes low, they're not as receptive. And in times of big hormonal swings like puberty, pregnancy, and perimenopause, we are going to see the effects of that more than we typically do. Yes, because those are much bigger shifts of, right. of, of hormones. But there's a bit of a U-shaped curve sometimes, so yeah. it's not linear. It's not like more and more and more estrogen, more and more and more dendrites. There's, there's, it's because the, you know, we, if we think about it, it's cyclical and it's responsive and mm -hmm. it's adaptive. So actually, if you look at um, increasing the con and, and studies have been done looking looking at this, we can do this in rodents in the research lab. We can do this in humans, but less well because living human women don't want to give up bits of their hippocampus or bits of their brain for us to look at under the microscope. So I, I don't understand why, why not? <laughs> but there's actually there's actually an, a, a, a U-shaped relationship there. So the more, you know, you get a, across the kind of the course of the menstrual cycle, we'll get kind of flourishing and then pruning and then flourishing and pruning. But in pregnancy, it's something different because we've got like these sky high levels of all of the estrogens because the placenta is also making them mm -hmm. and the kind of the HPO axis is kind of the brakes are off so that, you know, the ovaries are also pumping a lot out. So we're getting a bigger dose of estrogen across the course of one pregnancy than we would get in the total of the rest of our lifespan. And the, the, the kind of the net result of that is actually pruning because there's mm -hmm. a bit of a U-shaped relationship there. So the so brain is never really straightforward it's always got there's always a feedback loop in there to mm -hmm. kind of throw us into a bit of a loop when we're trying to explain that so then would it be fair to say that there's also this this i'm going to call it expansion of the dendrites and contraction of the dendrites throughout the menstrual cycle because of estrogen levels changing yes that's partly because of estrogen but we've also got progesterone in there so we we understand this most well and like shout out to to kind of one of the sort of you know the queens of, of neuroscience research Catherine Woolley who was the first person to show that the brain actually reacted and responded to these fluctuations of sex hormones this is back in the 90s and she got wow. a bit of pushback when she first presented this this research at a, at, a, at a neuroscience research conference but now it's I mean I could if I was to take my textbook out from underneath my microphone here you don't would, do I that could show you, <laughs> I could show you the pictures in the, in the neuroscience textbook now so across the course of a menstrual cycle and particularly within the hippocampus of the brain. And we see this in the estrus cycle in, in, the, in little mammals that we study in the research lab where it's far easier, or at least they sacrifice themselves for us to be able mm -hmm. to do the, the, mm. the research in the way that humans aren't going to. Animal, you know, people have got different thoughts about animal research, but that's where we get most of our data from. So in a particular region of the hippocampus, she was able to see these little neurites flourishing when estrogen went up and then kind of retracting when estrogen went down. We, if we do very, very, very careful studies of human brains and brain imaging, we, you know, we put someone in an MRI scanner and then we do precision imaging and we're really only getting to the point where the resolution is enough for us to be able to sort of see let's look at the hippocampus of living human women across the course of the cycle we see some parts of the hippocampus kind of getting slightly bigger probably mm. due to flourishing of new of, of neurites and then other parts kind of retracting and there's a bit of a relationship there between levels of estrogen and levels of progesterone but it's it's very kind of it's very complicated and we're really only getting to the point where we can map this very carefully, but still quite roughly, I would say, mm -hmm. in human women at the moment. We're, the technology is going through great leaps and bounds. It's beautiful. But it's probably only been in the last five years that we've started to get any decent data through from living human women's brains. And because we've got all of these amazing women in the neuroscience kind of space now mm -hmm. who are asking the questions and getting the funding in. And there's some really cool amazing. research groups around the world that are driving this research forward and that's asking these questions. So would it be fair to say then we may have noticed that our brain was working differently when we had a menstrual cycle, but the swings were very subtle and because the highs and lows of estrogen within yep. 28 yep. to 32 days yep. is just not enough for us. I mean, we might be like, I'm not quite myself today, but then mm. five days later, if mm. estrogen's higher, we might feel more in, in sync. But since we're not, you know, 
culturally mm. talking about that brain change, we may not have been aware of it. But once we get to menopause, because estrogen is declining, to, you know, by natural, its natural state, are we noticing it more? It's always been there, yeah. but we're just noticing it more because of the decline being so consistent and so steep. Yeah, I think, well, firstly, I would say different women have very, very different experiences, mm -hmm. as I said, across the, you know, if we just look at naturally cycling women across their lifespan, as I said, some women will react incredibly, they're riding the roller coaster, you know, they've mm -hmm. got PMS, they've got PMDD, they're really noticing these shifts. Other women are just like, I don't, I'm just carrying on, I don't, don't really notice everything. Mm -hmm. And then we've got lots of different people sort of in between. Perimenopause is different because we've not necessarily just got declining levels of hormones, we've got roller coastering levels right. of hormones, particularly in that perimenopause, because as our ovaries run out of eggs, you know, one month there may not be a lot of estradiol released from our ovaries. So the brain, the hypothalamus and the pituitary are going, hey, <laughs> next time, louder, more, we can't hear you. And the ovaries mm. go, oh my God, okay. And uh, then there's more estrogen. And then the next yeah. month, the brain's going, no, not, not that much. So we get this real roller coastering. And we've got the ratios between your estrogen and your progesterone are shifting and shaping and changing. We, we, mo we mostly understand from a neurobiological kind of mechanistic perspective, which is what I kind of like, the, neuro the neuroscience, mm -hmm what is happening in terms of the vasomotor symptoms and how they're a neurological consequence of these changing levels of hormones, whereby in our hypothalamus, which is a part of the brain which does things like regulate body temperature and it receives information about hormones and you know heart rate and blood pressure, et cetera, for some reason, <laughs> and I'm not entirely sure what, why Mother Nature had this in mind when you know we evolved this way, the hypothalamic thermostat, which regulates our body temperature, is tweaked and set in women by levels of estrogen. And when you've got these roller coastering levels of estrogen, the neurons involved in that thermostat get much more hyperreactive. So it's almost as if the level of the thermostat gets much narrower or the kind of happy, healthy range is much narrower. So your body temperature only needs to rise very slightly for it to kind of hit the top level mm, and your beautiful. hypothalamus to go, oh my God, it's hot in here, panic stations. And it sets off this massive kind of heat dissipation response, mm. which is both physiological and that we sweat, we vasodilate. Part of that is controlled by a sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So we get this massive kind of sympathetic nervous system discharge. Mm -hmm. And lots of women can feel that, mm -hmm. particularly if you are asleep. You can yeah. feel it because your brain might have tried sweating a bit, but you've got your covers on. And then the brain's like, girl, we need to wake up. <laughs> to throw mm. the covers off and you'll get this kind of, you can almost feel like this kind of discharge go through oh, your yeah. body and you kind of wake up. So you've got this massive sympathetic nervous system sort of response, which is an attempt to cool you down because the brain's panicking, thinking you were overheated. Right. Um, so we've kind of got the involvement of our autonomic nervous system in, in there as well. So why the estrogen is involved with this process. Yeah, it's a great I question. Yet, but, I would like to know. I'm not entirely sure whether anyone has got there yet, apart from the fact that everything is kind of interrelated. And why that part of the brain is so, takes so long to kind of, sh because some women can have these vasomotor symptoms for seven, eight, nine, ten years. Mm. Some women don't notice them, some women don't have any, other women do. And why it takes the brain so long to adapt and respond. Because mm -hmm. sometimes the brain adapts and responds quite quickly and, and you know, it, it will adapt and, and within a year you'll find others, it takes a much longer time. I'm not entirely sure what's going on here. There's probably loads of different components. So we understand that quite well. That Those vasomotor symptoms can have knock-on effects both physiologically, neurologically and also psychologically, mm. particularly if they're responsible for waking you up multiple times a right. night. Right. There's a neuroscience researcher, Pauline Mackey. You should totally get her on your podcast. She has tracked how many times, if we, we're getting vasomotor hot flashes overnight, how many times are women waking up, You know, how many are getting at night, how many are you getting during the day. And we know... You know, if you go through the course of a night and you, you, you're healthy and well, you've got this beautiful sleep architecture where you go into deep sleep and up again and down, back down into deep sleep and you go through all of those cycles and stages of sleep, 
vasomotor symptoms are completely disrupting that, whether you remember waking up or not. Um, oh, interesting. So we've kind of got that. So we've got this massively disrupted sleep architecture, whether or not you remember waking up. On top of that, and this is, there are not very many research labs studying this around the place, perhaps one or two, one I know is in Santiago in Chile, they're interested in this autonomic nervous system response. Because we tend to focus in on the brain, but we've got a brain and nervous system. Mm -hmm. If you are repeatedly activating your sympathetic nervous system over and over and over again to cool you down, well, we start becoming, we get more, and, and there's less parasympathetic nervous system kind of bringing you kind of back to baseline. The parasympathetic and the ne sympathetic nervous system are always kind of working kind of in harmony together. You're repeatedly activating your sympathetic nervous system. Well, then you mm -hmm. kind of become hypervigilant and wired. Right. And you right. start noticing, oh, I'm mm. kind of waking up with a fright, like what's going on? And I don't know about you, but if you get woken up at night and you can't get back to sleep, it doesn't take very long to find something to just worry about. Oh, it's, it's not the like worst. you sit there and go, cool, Ugh. I'm just going to lie here and think about awesome no. fun stuff. It's horrible. You immediately go directly to the catastrophe, whether that be, you know, thinking about, and I've got teenage sons and I've got oh aging parents and, you know, whether it's immediately what's in front of you or whether it's that silly thing you said when you're in high school, there will be something. And because we're kind of hypervigilant, our brain's going, oh, well, we're feeling anxious for some reason, we must fill in the gaps. So we've kind of got that playing out as well. That happens, you imagine, that happens one night. Imagine if it's happening days or weeks or months and oh, we're yeah. not finding any way to kind of modify oh, yeah. or react or respond or adapt. It's almost inevitable that some people are going to start feeling anxious and lots of women might say that these kind of growing levels of feelings of anxiety, not necessarily clinical anxiety, mm -hmm. but feeling anxious might be one of the earlier signs of, of going through perimenopause. We've also got, you know, some women, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a, a, a window of kind of vulnerability for women starting to experience depression, mm -hmm. particularly women who have had prior experiences of depression. It's a really, particularly if, you know, they, they were the women who had PMS or they were the women who struggled postnatally you know, they kind of feel like they know they're hormonally sensitive. This might be another window of vulnerability to experience depression. Mm -hmm. Occasionally you'll get women where it's first time they've, mm -hmm. they've experienced depression, but most commonly it's women with these prior experiences. So we've kind of got this perfect storm. Right. Unpacking what's underlying all of these negative neurological symptoms you know, the, the, we're not quite there yet. Is it directly due to estrogens acting on neurons in the brain? Or is it like we've got these dominoes lined up, you know, with the mm. vasomotor symptoms and the sleep and perhaps a bit of anxiety and perhaps depression? And then have we got some knock-on effects in terms of overall metabolic health, overall That's immune I, yeah. health, overall cardiovascular health? Because if you're not sleeping <laughs> and then you, it's much harder to exercise the next day and manage your diet well. And perhaps you've got, you know, a lot of social you know, concerns, you know, you've got chaos in right. the family or something. We've got all these dominoes. So what's like the first domino to fall? Yeah, right. It's a it's a bit of it's a bit yeah. of a perfect storm time. And it's so it's hardly surprising lots of women yeah. struggle when we go through this phase of life. And that I am was... fifty. And so I can kind of put my hands up and say I I kind of I I do my damn just to do all of the things, but I'm familiar with how it feels yeah which is beautiful that you teach it from yeah. that from that place which is so helpful i mm -hmm. the the two in the morning wake up i used to call it the i would do a worry scan it was like i would wake up and then my brain would be like okay which topic do you want to try to fix right now <laughs> it's yeah it's a bit like that and i think you know this we, we haven't talked about how we can kind of manage this but there's hormone therapies etc you know pick or choose what you're going to use here but cognitive behavioral therapy for mm. insomnia is you know, a, a really great kind of holistic kind of I call it bottom up outside and top down or biopsychosocial way to help address this because we need to get to the point where we're just not kind of giving in and going well I've woken up at night therefore I will worry it can become right. very habitual what techniques and tools do you have that you can kind of intervene and and convince yourself to not worry and be able to go back to sleep. Sounds easier said than done, mm -hmm. but there are resources and tools and support out there 
if this is the kind of situation you find yourself in mm. because it can become it's very it's a very easy feedback loop to to kind of lean into right particularly right. particularly because you've got this autonomic nervous system involvement as well as your mind right right um, yeah once like those two start that's and that's kind of how we end up with people with kind of anxiety and or depression we need to kind of roll roll that back and kind of intervene as early as possible and protecting sleep is one of the most yeah. important ways to do of that. Of course. Yeah. And that's what I always hear when when they're like, here are the lifestyle tools you should do as you go through perimenopause. And one of them is like, get a good night's sleep. And I think whoever created yeah. that list never went through perimenopause because well, it's, it's not a, the it's easiest. It's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. It's a great idea if you knew how to, if you knew yes. how to do it. Yeah. Do you, do but you... we do have tools and resources there for, for, for people. So I think... Yeah cognitive behavioral therapy I've heard that with an eye at the end is that's 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 Amazing. your go -to.